So I have a friend who is really into Halloween. And I'm not talking about you, Sue, but you definitely qualify as someone who's really into Halloween. She is into Halloween like you're into Halloween. And in Kansas City, there are a number of these haunted houses. And I haven't seen anything here, but these are like big old um, like factories and things like that. And then they turn them in. I mean, these are like adult homes and houses. They charge $30 to $50 to get into these haunted houses. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and there's several of them in Kansas City. This is a big deal. And she loves to go to them and be scared. And obviously, lots of people go to them because they charge that much and they're open for a month. So, obviously, lots of people like them. And it's interesting because all these people like to go and be scared, but they're in an environment which is actually really, really safe. So, it's kind of like, you're okay, I can be scared because I know I'm not actually in danger. Some part of you knows that. And now that's not really my preference. I lean towards the silly or the fantasy or the, sometimes the quirky when it comes to dressing up. Um, and but indulging in that scary and the ghosts and the vampires and all of that is fun for some. It, it's from, it's good fun. But fear is not so much fun when we don't realize that that's what's driving us. The unknown is a common thing to fear. In the 50s, we had all these movies about things like Godzilla and the attack of the 50-foot woman. They were tapped into people's uncertainty about the effects of nuclear technology, things like that. And during the Cold War, we saw victorious Westerners conquering the awful communists. And in the 90s, we had Remember Outbreak and some of those other pandemic, epidemic type movies? That was what was in the con that was what we were fearing. That was in our consciousness of fear at the time. And so we had movies that tapped into that. I think Jurassic Park is sort of on the edge of that too, as far as you know, the the things that science can do. Oh my goodness. And now there seems to be a lot of things about zombies and apocalyptic worlds. I have a theory about that. And my theory is that lots of people feel like something is changing, that there is a shift happening. And I agree. So this post-apocalyptic zombie thing is one way of, of understanding that something's changing. I think it's... A, an emerging consciousness that's changing. I think it's, we're going the other, a different direction than that. I think it's a major turning point in consciousness, and I'm not the only one who thinks this. I think that we are in this change, emerging into a more inclusive world, a world that works for all. Can you imagine what a world that works for all actually could look like? To some people, that's sort of post-apocalyptic, but to me, that would be pretty great. Where everyone's need from it, it's like, we're going to have a John Lennon moment here, right? But that doesn't sell anywhere near as much as suspense and zombies. So, there you go. So, as we go about our next couple days, we will no doubt see some ghosts and heroes walking around our neighborhoods and our grocery stores and who knows where else. And it's a great reminder of us to consider our more tangible or unconscious fears. See, fear gets in the way of a lot of things. Has fear ever got any in the way of anything for you? Yeah. It it not only possibly gets in the way of unnecessary but potentially fun things like skydiving or something like that. That could be fun, but you don't really need to do it. But it also gets us in the way of important things like welcoming someone who we perceive as different or standing up for someone who's being mistreated. Many of the conflicts in our world come down to a simple difference of beliefs or background. And not only is the other feared because they are different, but because the difference is felt to be a threat because their existence means change.
in the book that we're, or the workbook that we're following, um, that's what it's called, Practicing Inclusivity. I just had one of those moments where I was like, it was gone, and then it came back. Practicing Inclusivity, Sharif Abdullah writes, Whenever people feel threatened by change, the philosophy of inclusivity is necessary. Regardless of the specific issue, the real issue is always the same. It can come in the form of, I am afraid of change. I am afraid of losing my identity. I am afraid of you. I am afraid of my well-being and the well-being of my family. Or I am afraid of losing power or control. But the core issue is, I am afraid. Isn't it nice that that fit with Halloween? <laughs> because we celebrate doing the fun, fear things on Halloween and we kind of have fun with it. But it's a great time to remind us about those things that we don't want to talk about, that we really are afraid of. So if we realize that we have these unconscious or conscious fears about who we perceive as different, we can consciously start to act from a new story. I mean, these things we learned growing up. It's so, um, do you remember that windstorm we had a couple days ago? It knocked down part of our fence. So the next day, I know, it's just been one thing after another. So um, our uh, landladies were over and putting up the fence and um, some friends of theirs came to help with the figuring out how to construct a fix to this fence and they brought their brand new beagle puppies. And that while absolutely adorable, these little puppies, um, there was two of them, were skittish about every new thing. You know, they turned on the saw and they were like, bah! the little puppies. So fear of what we don't understand or what is different than what we're used to is a perfectly normal and common response. It keeps us safe, but it also gets us in a lot of trouble, right? So those little puppies are, you know, I mean, yeah, that, that's the right thing for them to do is be like, oh, new sound, I gotta figure out what it is and see if I need to move away. That's a good thing. Except for once you learn what it is and you realize it's not scary, we need to let it not be scary. Many years ago, I was involved in a play because, you know, theater was my background before I got swept up into the going to be a minister when I grow up sort of thing. And so uh, this play was written about a conflict, long-standing, many people and countries involved kind of conflict. And it was written from the perspective of both sides. There was characters that coincided from both sides. And this writer had had close relationships with people on both sides. And he said that many of the, the dialogue, much of the dialogue, was words that he'd heard those people on either side actually saying. And you know what? They said the same thing. They said they wanted their families to be safe. They said they wanted this conflict to be over so they could get on with it. They had the same, the grandmothers had the same caring for their grandchildren. The, you know, it, the same kind of things that we feel about our loved ones. It was all the same. But they also had the stories about how the other group had done them wrong, which, you know, when you're in that cycle, that's sort of how it happens sometimes. And what this story illustrated is that in these conflicts, there's no simple diplomatic or military solution because there's so much story around it. But there's at least one different, deeper, deeper truth. And that is that we have these values that are the same. It doesn't matter what side of a line you were born on. Because all the lines in the world, those are imaginary. So it doesn't matter where you were born. We have these same values. We share these values of family and community and respect. We love the people near us. 
We want the best for them. It's the same. And this reminds us that we are so much more alike than we are different. And so the solution comes down to not diplomatic solutions or military solutions, but it comes down to a revolution of consciousness. To overcoming our fear of what we perceive as different. To overcoming our fear of change. Woo, doggy. Fear of change. And overcoming our fear that our neighbor is having what they need somehow takes away from me having what I need. If we believe that we live in an unlimited universe, if we believe that we are the presence of God, we are one presence, one power, then there's enough for everybody. There is enough for everybody. So my neighbor having what they need does not take away from me having what I need. And then to overcome our fear of those we see is different. It's, we may not think that in our minds, but there may be a little tweak of that somewhere inside of us. So, so we have five basic unity principles, right? Number two is that divine spark, the Christ presence, the Christ potential is in everybody. Now, if we really believe this, that everyone is the one presence and one power, then who do we put outside? Who? Jesus is said to spend time with cat tax collectors and lepers and fallen women. Heck, he hung out with women, which was bad enough. Any kind of woman. In the first century, all of that was as bad as you could get. So, insert your least favorite politician or the folks pushing legislation that will hurt you or your loved ones, etc., in that same spot. And you might, might see, start to see why a revolutionary consciousness is what Jesus was trying to teach us. Because I know I have certainly put some individuals and some organizations in the spot of the lepers. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Yeah. So that was like, as I'm like working on this yesterday, I'm like, shoot, shoot, oh. <laughs> was having a little bit of like a real moment there, you know? It's like, oh, okay. Because inclusivity, as we said last week, is not a destination we arrive at. It's a goal that we work towards. So it's okay. Just going to keep working towards it. Now that I realize that, so this inclusive goal is moved towards by eliminating exclusion. Seems kind of obvious, right? We find, move towards this goal by finding common ground, like the grandmothers who know that they care for their grandchildren above all, right? We move towards this by learning about others through listening and dialogue. Well, you have a very different view on that would you be willing to tell me why? <clears throat> I'm not saying that you're going to agree with them. I'm saying that we're going to find a common ground, maybe. At least understanding. And, of course, we move towards this inclusive world by facing our discomforts and fears. Just like the little ghosties and goblins that might show up on your door on Tuesday. So inclusion does happen on paper sometimes, right? Laws are passed and new freedoms are allowed to previously limited groups. But what happens on paper and what is happening in culture and what is felt in our hearts are not always the same, right? And usually when someone is celebrating a new law or policy, there's somebody else who is not. So our work is for inclusive and just laws without making the folks who disagree with us the other, the bad guy. They are the folks who disagree with us. 
who are doing the best they can with what they have. And you know what? They're doing it probably out of the same values for the reason we're wanting what we want. Because they want their family to be safe. Because they want fairness. Because they want, and, and they just see from a completely point of view, they have the same values, usually. It kind of blows your mind, but it's true. They are us. Our work is to stand with those who are excluded and support them in, in gaining the parity and the justice. Our work is to internalize to our core that we are linked to one another. And that as a human family and as beings traveling this earth, we are impacted by each other's actions and inactions. So, it is not ours to get caught up in the bigness of this responsibility because it's a lot. But instead to be inspired each day to do something to make it better than the day before. Just one thing. That's how a revolution of consciousness happens. How do you move a mountain one rock at a time? That's how I'm gonna move a mountain. That's how we move them out, one rock at a time. How do we change our consciousness? One thought at a time. One day at a time. And that is our work. Overcoming any fear. Yeah.